good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you here. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. We are delighted to have you here for this briefing that we are co-sponsoring today with the National League of Cities. Uh, it was no one's idea that this briefing would be quite so timely in terms of the topic facing us today, in terms of how can cities become more resilient or become resilient to extreme weather. Uh, unfortunately, we have been witnessing extremes of all manner across our whole country. And I know that our hearts have gone out to so many people dealing with so many different situations, whether they be in the West dealing with fires or dealing with hurricanes in Texas and in the Southeast. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was formed back in 1984 by bipartisan congressional caucus that was very concerned about finding ways to talk about energy and environmental issues in a way to bring people together in a bipartisan way to learn more and to find common sense, practical policy solutions to problems facing us across this great country and around the world. So that is our mission and our briefings are an important piece of how we work to deliver uh, solid information to policymakers and to uh, people across um, the country and to certainly the whole policy community. So we are very, very glad to see you all here in terms of looking at this very important topic. Talking about resilience is part of a whole series of briefings that EESI has engaged upon this year and in prior years. We have also looked at the issue of resilience, but this year we have been doing a series of briefings looking at resilience and doing so in partnership with state and local government officials because they are extraordinarily important voices because they are the ones who are dealing with so many situations on the ground, they are the first ones to have to understand, to figure out, to solve problems, to help their citizens in terms of dealing with all manner of situations. So I think everyone has been acutely aware of um, many issues that are confronting uh, certainly local governments across the country as they try to grapple with all sorts of situations. The issues that we are all confronting are bigger than any of us, which is why I think it's so important for us to come together to talk about things, how we can all help each other, how we can learn from each other, how we can all do a better job on behalf of all of the people of our country. So we're delighted to be partnering, as I said, with the National League of Cities, which has been taking a lot of leadership in terms of working with their, uh, with their mayors, their city managers, with regard to resilience, helping cities to address these issues. And we are so glad to have a wonderful panel on this issue for you to, uh, today. We will first hear from the mayor of Pittsburgh. Uh, from William Peduto, who has been, uh, the, he was elected mayor of Pittsburgh in 2013. He, in that period of time, he has also been a very important leader for the National League of Cities as well. And he has spent 19 years in uh, the Pittsburgh City Council, as well as being on the staff of city government. And in his uh, role, in terms of being on city council, he was involved in so many different council committees, so he learned city government up one side and down the other, and which equipped him very, very well in terms of his whole role as mayor and in terms of being an important leader that other cities now look to. He has been especially interested in sustainable transportation and community-based development, and he also um, has presided over uh, another important venture, which is that Pittsburgh in 2014 was selected as one of the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities. 
that enabled Pittsburgh to hire a chief resilience officer who is tasked with implementing the city's resilience plan. So we're going to hear more about all of that uh, this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Peduto. Thank you. Thanks, girl. Um, I'm going to try to be brief, and I'm going to try to take us off on a little bit of a journey to start this discussion, because resiliency is obviously a buzzword today, and if you're a city and you don't have a chief resiliency officer, you will. Um, but it really goes back throughout American history. And I just want to take a little bit of a tour of the city of Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh back in the mid 18th century was a French fort town. We were Fort Duquesne. And there was a young major in the Virginia militia who marched over the um, Allegheny Mountains and he came saying that Virginia and the British want this area, this confluence of the Allegheny and the Monongahela to form the Ohio and go out west. And on his way back, going back down to Virginia in the middle of the night, he slit the throat of a young French ensign named Jamonville, and thus began the First World War. His name was George Washington, and the Seven Year War, the French and Indian War, was fought because they loved us so much. A little bit of revisionism in our history lesson, by the way. Um, and that's what we became. We were a frontier town, and, and the resiliency back then meant Seneca's smallpox and mountain lions, better known as Pitt Panthers and Penn State Nittany Lions. But they, the fact was they built a fort, they built the walls high, they, they made sure that there was interaction with Native Americans, they kept it kind of simple, and that's what they built the city around, a resilient city. Fast forward, 19, 13, or 1813 or something like that, a couple guys get in a boat down by Heinz Field, their names are Lewis and Clark, and they discover Ohio. No, they discover the West. And in that process, they manifest destiny, she, see the shining sea, and they say, yes, but who's going to build it? And during that first part of the modern industrial revolution, they looked over their shoulder and they said, Pittsburgh. And long before it was ever steel, it was stone and lumber. It was iron. And Pittsburgh boomed under the first revolution. And we built wooden houses up next to factories. And by 1845, we burned our city to the ground in Pittsburgh and the Great Fire of 1845 was decimated. But it would build back from its ashes and it would grow and folks like Andrew Carnegie and Andrew Mellon and Henry Clay Frick and George Westinghouse would build the leader of the second industrial revolution when electricity would move product. And in that process they also created the greatest disparity between the haves and the have-nots, between those immigrants that came to work in the mills and the mines and those that managed and had owned them. They created the worst air pollution in American history. Our lights stayed on 24 hours a day because it was so polluted you couldn't see. And they created water that was poisonous to drink. And in that time period, those great disparities were not externalities of some 19th century economics. They were the realities that Pittsburgh had to, had to abide by. And I often think back at that time and how Carnegie and Frick really hated each other because I am certain that had they worked together, the university in Oakland would have been known as Carnegie, Frick, and Mellon. <laughs> but they did do other things. We created the first Clean Air Act in American history. We banned the burning of coal in our furnaces and we cleaned up our air moving further than any city has in the prospect of cleaning air. We still have a lot to work to do, but we traveled further into that, into that territory. We worked in our mines and our mills to organize our workers, and we created the middle class in this country. Pittsburgh and Detroit and Buffalo and cities is where the middle class was born. And we lessened that disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And we created great water campaigns. A young Western Pennsylvania woman named Rachel Carson became the matriarch of the modern environmental movement, marching up these steps of Congress. And we did it in our own city, cleaning up our rivers and being able to put together for a next generation. And that's what resiliency was based upon. From the 19, from the 1846 flood, or I'm sorry, fire to 1936 floods to economic devastation and environmental degradation we were able to become resilient. And that went really well up until 1979. Pirates won the World Series, been a long time. Billy Stargell, we are family. Steelers won their fourth Super Bowl in six years, and Pittsburgh died. 
We died. Our economic heart was ripped out of us. We had to find a way to rebuild. We lost more people than New Orleans lost after Katrina, and they never came back. We have almost double, well, actually triple, the amount of unemployment that Detroit has today in the city of 19% unemployment, greater than during the Great Depression. And we had a debt of city government that was higher than New York City's when they went bankrupt. But there were no federal bailout plans for us. There were no programs. We had to learn how to build a resiliency for economics. And we have, and we've come back. And now we sit at this date where we're talking about resiliency and looking at it through a lens of man-made failures, environmental failures, economic failures, and a model of a city that's been able to bounce back from all three. But the one thing that we didn't do in any of those cases was prepare. We never built into the strategy of today, what about tomorrow? And so we've put together a resiliency plan through 100 resilient cities and the Rockefeller Foundation called 1PGH. And we looked at this model first through the lens of our environment. Because yes, in Pittsburgh, we're having 100 year rains on a constant basis as well. But we don't have shorelines, we have riverfronts. We have hills that fall down and fall to the ground. We have people who have lost their lives sitting at a traffic signal as the water has raced up so fast they had no way to get out of their automobile. And we have never put in a green infrastructure plan to be able to take that water and do anything but move it into pipes that are now over capacity. So as we look at our plan, we basically analyze what are the shocks and what are the stresses that we should be looking at. In other words, if they were looking at this during the second industrial revolution, when the industrial titans were working at that, they would have noticed the need to be able to clean the air. We wouldn't have waited 50 years. They would have noticed the need to have clean water and what would be so important about building up an opportunity for everyone under that economy. Today, we see our shocks as infrastructure collapse. A nation that doesn't invest in its infrastructure and just assumes it will solve itself is a nation that doesn't face reality. Hazmat accidents that could be done in any part of our city, whether it's uh, uh, crude oil that is running through the heart of our downtown to experiments being done at the University of Pittsburgh in NBC type of uh, environments. An economic collapse because even though we've diversified our economy, it doesn't mean that outside factors could have an effect. And climate change and extreme weather is the key ingredient of building a sustainable city of the future that's based on a re resiliency strategy. But at the same time, what we didn't realize, but what we found out after a year of talking to the people in the city, of talking to the stakeholders, is that the stresses that we'd face on a daily basis were f based on other factors as well economic and racial inequality will be something that will hold the city back unless it's addressed proactively in giving people opportunities. Everything from affordable housing options to the ability to have pre-K for every three and four year old in our city and a scholarship waiting for them when they graduate. Environmental degradation is the model of an American city that can say we did it wrong. We now have our opportunity to be able to say if we did it, so can you. Aging infrastructure and fragmentation, the, the basic cores of responsibility of local, state, and national government being ignored and just pushed off to another generation. All of these factors come together as you start to build out a local government and understand that when you're buying and creating that recreation center or senior center for today, make sure that it's filled with cots because you may need it tomorrow. The whole idea about creating a resiliency strategy is not based upon the needs of government today, but based upon the needs of the people tomorrow. And as we look at these real issues of environmental climate change that are affecting cities on the coasts and those that are in the core of this country and cities throughout the world, we have to be able to realize what tomorrow's problems will bring with another economic shift where we don't even know what work will look like in 10 years. And what are we doing about it today to be able to minimize the negative impacts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was um, 
something that I think we all should think about very, very carefully. It affects everything in terms of how we should be looking at things, and I think Pittsburgh is very lucky to have you. I now want to turn to our second panelist who comes to us today from Flagstaff, Arizona. And that is Nicole Woodman, who is the sustainability manager for the city of Flagstaff. Uh, Nicole, as city sustainability manager, focuses on the development of effective programs and policies to catalyze long-term community and organizational sustainability. She's responsible for growing the city's sustainability section from the ground up. Her focus areas include energy efficiency, renewable energy, climate adaptation, resiliency, legally designated open space, waste minimization, food systems, and community empowerment. And actually, I think that as we listen to the mayor, that all of those kinds of things were all part of what's encompassed within Pittsburgh's resilience plan as well. And so Nicole is currently leading the charge to bring Flagstaff's energy portfolio to 100% renewable energy to develop a community-wide climate action and adaptation plan and to introduce the framework to achieve zero waste. And Flagstaff um, in 2012 completed its resiliency and preparedness study to assess the vulnerability, and get this, to assess the vulnerability of 115 of its critical weather impacted operations and they have begun work on their climate action and adaptation plan. So just as Mayor Peduto talked about all sorts of different factors that were involved, when you think about it in terms of Nicole's 115, this is happening in every city that local officials have to deal with. It can be quite, it can feel overwhelming and yet it's so critically important. So we are delighted that Nicole is here to talk about sustainability and Flagstaff. Thank you to our host today and to Mayor Peduto. My name is Nicole Antonopoulos Woodman and it's an honor to be here to share Flagstaff's story with you. So before we get started, I would just like to give a little context to Flagstaff. And it looks like we're getting a little truncated on the screen there. But um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Flagstaff, it was founded in 1882. So a much shorter history than that of, of the East Coast in Pittsburgh. But it is the largest city in northern Arizona. And it is the regional economic hub of our county and the northern part of the state. Flagstaff is nestled at the base of the San Francisco peaks at 7,000 feet. Our peaks reach almost 13,000 feet, just to give you some geographic content here. And we are surrounded by the largest contiguous ponderosa pine forest in the world. That comes in to be a very important factor here in a few minutes. Our population is just under 68,000. However, we host almost 5 million tourists a year. So we are an all seasons destination and we have a lot of considerations when we're talking about community sustainability and resiliency. So we do know that the West is experiencing climatic changes at an accelerated rate. What that means for our inner mountain West community is rising temperatures, intensified storms, reduced snowpack, drier forest outside of the monsoon season, increased severity and frequency of forest fires, and a shift in precipitation patterns from rain, excuse me, from snow to rain, and an increased risk of flooding during those changes. So 2010 was a year of extremes for us in Flagstaff. In January, we received five feet of snow in five days. That 70-inch snowstorm coupled with a 30-inch snowstorm that previous December broke our budget for snow operations in less than 30 days. We disrupted operations and commerce and it wreaked havoc on our infrastructure. The spring, we experienced record warming and low moisture. We had high winds that shut down our I-40 transportation corridor more times in one month than in history. And we had destructive tornadoes. 
in the early part of June, the catastrophic wildfire that our community had been bracing for finally happened. So if there was a silver lining to 2010, it was that we had a living laboratory. Uh, extreme, we had a climatic extremes to study, analyze, and to learn from. So with a series of those catastrophic events behind us, we set out to answer a number of questions. How can the city organization reduce its vulnerability and build organizational resilience to climate variability and climate-related issues? And more importantly, what are the risks if we don't act? Over the course of the next 12 months, we assess the level of vulnerability, the degree of risk, and the potential impacts to those 115 areas that Carol mentioned of city operations that are exposed to climate variability. We analyzed seven systems, and as I mentioned, more than 100 key planning areas. What we learned was that we must take a systems approach if we are to prepare for the changing climate, protect our assets, and meet our service commitments. It was no surprise that water quality, water resources, and water infrastructure, along with forest health, were our most vulnerable areas with the highest risk. What we also learned is that we can no longer ignore the interdependence of our systems. We also recognize that we cannot control the volatility of change and that we must design and redesign systems while operating under a wider range of economic, social, and environmental considerations. So the Flagstaff Watershed Project, also known as the FWPP, is a great example of our effort to do just that. So during 10 days of June in 2010, a 15,000 acre fire, which is small in comparison to everything that's happening in the West right now, um, ripped through the Coconino National Forest, just northeast of Flagstaff. The damage from the Schultz fire came around one month later, when intense rains washed debris settlement and ash downhill and caused local flooding, damaging homes, roads, and infrastructure. The total impact of the fire, including cleanup, loss in personal wealth, flood insurance premiums, was estimated at about $140 million. The event was tragic, and it was fortunate that the city of Flagstaff watershed was not directly impacted. The damage and cost of life if the south side of the San Francisco peaks burned was estimated at between 500 and $100 million. So the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project which really is a result of decades of collaboration and communication research with local partners, regional agencies, was designed to prevent catastrophic flooding and protect Flagstaff's water supply. It expedites forest treatments and environmental analysis in the watershed north of downtown Flagstaff. On the heels of the Schultz fire in 2012, city voters approved a $10 million bond to help seed the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project. Keep in mind, $10 million for forest treatment is literally the proverbial drop in the bucket. Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project is the first of its, of its kind. It's a payment for ecosystem services, a PES project that uses taxpayer money on federal land to protect a local jurisdiction's watershed. It's a result of multi-agency partnerships, as I mentioned, between the city of Flagstaff, the Forest Service, the state of Arizona, tribal nations, Northern Arizona University, and a number of forest partnerships. So in 2002, or excuse me, 2012, the tax was passed, the bond was passed. In 2013 to 15, the NEPA process began and then today, we are actually in the forest thinning. And for those of you that can see the screen, you can see an example of a treatment area. And you can see the density of the forest in the upper right-hand corner, and then post-treatment in the lower right-hand corner. This is a significant difference. So what made the Forest um, Watershed Protection Project bond successful? We believe it was enhanced public awareness of fire and of water nexus that the prior education of forest health and fire threat was significant and effective, that investing in our community assets became a priority. And then we had a strong focus on cost avoidance, 
Northern Arizona Rural Policy Institute released a cost avoidance study. And the study results estimate a range of potential losses from catastrophic wildfire and post-fire flooding between $573 million and $1.2 billion. So we felt that a $10 million seed money was a good investment for our community. We've also been able to leverage the money from the $10 million bond against uh, additional funding mechanisms. So next, I'd like to just touch, the, um, touch down on our climate action and an adaptation planning that is currently underway. One of the things that we are focusing on in Flagstaff is really building off momentum. Um, as I mentioned, we have had a lot of activity around the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project, and we really want to now take this out into the community and start talking about climate action and adaptation. So we've set, we're working to set goals in the community to reduce emissions, which we've had within our organization since 2008, but now we're ready and primed to take this out to our community. And we want to outline specific steps that the community will take to reduce those emissions, so focusing on mitigation. And then we're going to actively engage and identify actions to prepare for climate changes. So what we want to see is very much focused on community action. We believe that a successful climate action and adaptation plan requires our community investment and our community to be involved in the process. With that in mind, we've set a community action group, we've pulled together a community action group long before we issued our RFP. We want this to be the voice of Flagstaff because we believe that success is only going to be achieved with our community members involved, our political leaders taking action, and us creating an identity around our actions. We also have a lot of other focus areas that support climate resiliency and climate action. Um, they range from residential energy efficiency programming to municipal projects looking at, for example, our asphalt. Flagstaff experiences more than 200 freeze thaw events a year, which means that our asphalt is, has to adapt to that changing in temperature swing of 40 plus degrees. So we've got a lot of things ahead of us. We have a lot of things to learn. But as I mentioned, we really do believe that we have a living laboratory and that we've got the resources locally and nationally with our peers to take on the challenge. So with that, thank you so much. And I look forward to answering some questions. Thanks so much, Nicole, for talking about and, uh, about Flagstaff and giving us a little bit of an eye in terms of the kind of approach that you are taking there and what this has meant in terms of uh, also thinking about how the fires, um, the forest fire that you uh, talked about, all of the different impacts that happened to the community as a result of that, and therefore all of the different pieces that needed to be uh, considered and put together in terms of helping solve that whole situation. Uh, so another important lesson and learning experience for all of us. So the third panelist for us today is Cooper Martin, who is the uh, program director um, for the Sustainable Cities Institute, which is an important part of the National League of Cities. And Cooper is, as I said, the program director where uh, the Institute provides uh, a whole variety of information, tools, and guidance to strengthen the ability of communities to help them to be able to thrive and to prosper while they are also facing the challenges, the kinds of challenges that you just heard about from, from Nicole and from Mayor Peduto um, in terms of dealing with uh, a changing climate and a very uncertain global economy. Um, and so his areas of expertise include climate resilience, community development, dealing with transportation, economics, and of course, emergency management. So we are delighted to have Cooper here to talk about um, the Institute and the cities to which the Institute is, is providing assistance. Like Nicole, I think I'm going to have to do a little dance here with uh, multiple 
moving across multiple uh, slide projections. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me, and, and thanks to EESI for agreeing to co-sponsor this uh, briefing or co-organize this briefing uh, with us today on, on a topic that, as we've mentioned, has uh, already been a little bit too timely, I think, for many of us. Um, the National League of Cities is an organization representing cities, uh, not just mayors, but council members, staff across the country. We have just shy of 2,000 member cities, uh, as well as uh, a network of state municipal leagues. All, all 49 of the state municipal leagues count themselves as members of our organization. So indirectly, we represent approximately 18,000 cities, towns, and villages uh, throughout the country. Uh, my program within that, the Sustainable Cities Institute, as you can see, provides resources to uh, catalyze, support, inform, and celebrate those city-led sustainability efforts. Uh, we, we cover not only uh, sustainability issues, traditional environmental issues like water, air quality, uh, things of that nature, open space, um, but I do uh, run a number of programs on renewable energy, on resilient business development, economic development, and things of that nature. Uh, you can find more, obviously, on our website, the Sustainable Cities Institute there. Uh, we've got a program called Soul Smart, trying to reduce the cost of solar around the country. Uh, we have another uh, alliance called the Water Now Alliance, a network of municipal officials who, uh, by virtue of their elected office, also serve on their water utility boards, uh, something that a lot of them probably don't know they're getting themselves into when they run for office on education, let's just say, or public safety, uh, and find themselves in charge of a water utility. Um, but today, obviously, we're going to be focusing on uh, the community resilience portfolio there, which you can kind of see. Um, and I think, uh, you know, to sort of introduce this program and the work that we're doing, uh, the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities program has already been invoked by other speakers. Most of you are probably familiar with it. And we're really working to see if the strategies, if the lessons learned from that effort and from that network of cities, which is really some of the global powerhouse cities, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world, to see if those strategies translate uh, and apply to cities that are smaller in population, smaller in budget, smaller in staff resources. Uh, what kind of challenges are they facing? Uh, and what are the strategies that they can employ, you know, given those limited uh, resources? You know, Nicole, I think, is probably uh, the head of one of the largest uh, sustainability departments in the country at this point for a city under 100,000. And Nicole, what, how, many, how many staff people do you have total right now? Five, yeah, <laughs> which is about five times as many as most uh, cities of her size. Um, I also want to point out that aside from this program, we, we run uh, a Resilient Cities Summit. We've done that for three years now in partnership with the Urban Land Institute and the United, uh, U.S. Green Building Council, uh, really to connect uh, local leaders, those people in decision-making uh, elected office, with um, their sustainability staff. So Nicole was able to participate with her mayor just this last summer. Um, but also to connect them with the people who are making uh, investment decisions in cities around the country, financiers, insurers, um, land use professionals, developers, um, in, a, in a low stakes sort of setting. Oftentimes these conversations are had uh, over policy discussions or over multi-million dollar development proposals, um, and that's not where you learn from one another. Um, so we try to give them a low stakes environment to have these kinds of discussions. Um, and so that's, that's something that I'm, I'm proud to say we've been able to do for a couple of years. But getting into the program specifically, uh, leadership and community resilience, one of the things that we try to do at the National League of Cities is take the passion that you've heard from our prior speakers who work in municipal government for their own community day in and day out and, and deliver those stories uh, to people who are like yourselves, uh, policymakers. Um, around the country and try to, to wrap this up. So I'll talk about a couple of cities that we've been working with, um, but I think that, that what we've been hearing today is really not unique. Um, it's emblematic of the kinds of challenges that a lot of communities are facing, you know, fires in Flagstaff, obviously they're raging throughout the West right now, but this is something I've heard over and over again from cities like Fort Collins um, and elsewhere, the, the same kinds of issues where you have a fire and then you have a water quality problem or a flooding problem immediately after the fact. Um, economic resilience and the story that uh, Mayor Perduto told is, is something that um, our second vice president, Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson of Gary, Indiana, has, has really made her own uh, platform uh, within the organization on. And so I wanted to impress upon you the fact that these case studies aren't just uh, you know, one-off stories. It's something that we've been hearing, um, that I've been hearing in my work at the NLC for the last several years. 
Um, so you can see the goals of the Leadership and Community Resilience Program there. We've been working with 10 communities throughout the country uh, for about the last year and a half now. We were able to give each of those cities small pass-through grants, $10,000, to host resilience events in their community um, and to define what that sort of initiative was going to look like. Is it going to focus on energy? Is it going to focus on water? Is it going to focus on jobs or, or some sort of social uh, aspect of resilience? And so here I, I always like to define my terms. Um, how many, I don't know how many people in this room have had difficulty explaining to colleagues or peers what the heck resilience actually is. Um, but this is the way I do it with our membership uh, of elected leaders. Um, I try to frame it in terms of goals and metrics, um, where sustainability, you're trying to limit the impact that you're going to have on the environment. Um, and with resilience, you're trying to limit the impact that the environment is going to have on you. And this works whether you're a building owner, whether you're a city, uh, whether you're a homeowner. Um, it, it's something that you can set clear goals on. And if you find an initiative, a policy, a project, something that meets both of these criteria, you've probably already done your cost benefit analysis in the process. Uh, it's probably going to be a worthwhile investment to make. Um, and so moving on from there, the 10 cities that we've been working with uh, around the country, I'm just going to touch on two of these. I won't go into cases of all 10. Uh, but we've been in Riverside, we've been in Tempe, we've been in San Antonio, St. Paul, Des Moines, uh, South Bend, Indiana, West Palm Beach, uh, where, where unfortunately everything is sort of unfolding uh, and they're waking up to uh, the devastation of Irma right now, uh, Portland, Maine, and Providence, Rhode Island. So first, before I continue, is anybody uh, from any of these cities? Any, anyone in the room? Which one? Uh, Phoenix Tempe. Phoenix Tempe. Okay. So close to San Antonio. We haven't been working with Houston on this project, although they are uh, uh, working with us on some equitable economic development issues. Um, but yeah, Tempe is an interesting case and, and something they're, they're mostly focused on heat, obviously, uh, but also flash flooding and, and the uh, steps that they can take to reduce both at the same time, providing more shade, providing more uh, vegetative cover um, that'll, that'll help with both of those. But the two stories I want to touch on uh, that so I, I think really encapsulate the cases we've, he we've heard today are first Annapolis, Maryland, uh, and second San Antonio, Texas, so, uh, so that we get a little bit of a flavor of what resilience looks like throughout the country. Um, in Annapolis, they uh, are obviously a historic coastal community. They're facing uh, both sea level rise threats and flash flooding threats from increased uh, rainfall. They're also uh, much the same as uh, uh, Flagstaff. They're, they're a primarily tourism-based economy, but they also have some pretty major uh, critical federal facilities, uh, the Naval Academy, uh, the Naval Base, um, and a lot of other uh, critical facilities around there that, that frankly, most cities of about 38,000 would, would envy uh, if they had those in their community. What we've been working on with them for the last year is Weather It Together, uh, which is a, a historic preservation effort primarily. So they're not coming at this from, you know, oh, climate change is a serious problem, we have to act. They're coming at it from you know, our downtown, our historic downtown, that's one of the oldest uh, communities in the country, uh, is really going to struggle to adapt to a changing economy. It's going to struggle to uh, adapt to increased storms. Um, and not just in the future, but, but what we're already seeing today, increased incidence of flooding. And so Weather It Together has been an award-winning process over the last several years to account for the economic impact of the downtown, to work with business owners as well as the Naval Academy and the Navy facilities there on how they can collaboratively protect their infrastructure, uh, whether it's a seawall or other uh, initiatives, and then how you can actually work within the historic preservation code uh, to make these necessary changes and change, you know, just thinking about windows uh, is something that the Historic Preservation Code takes very, very seriously, and they can't make their buildings more energy efficient just by installing new windows. They have to be very sensitive to the fact that their entire downtown is a historic district. Um, and so the money that they uh, have is actually being used for an international conference this fall uh, called Keeping History Above Water. So they're going to have communities from all over the globe, um, from all up and down the East Coast, coming and figuring out how cities can learn from one another uh, to apply some of these critical lessons, how you can protect historic resources along the coast, um, how you can work within uh, these codes and, and processes to make sure that building owners, that the people are protected while preserving your character and not completely demolishing everything and building it 10 feet higher than it was before. Because so that's really not an option, uh, both financially and legally for them. 
And then San Antonio, Texas, uh, which is uh, basically the polar opposite. Um, it's a city of 1.9 million currently. They're obviously not facing uh, sea level rise, but they do have some serious flash flooding issues. The issues that they're most concerned about are, first of all, heat, uh, because heat is actually one of the deadliest conditions uh, nationwide. It kills more people uh, than any other weather-related disaster. Uh, but it also causes things like crime spikes. And if you ask any police chief in the country, you know, if it gets above 92, 93 degrees, do you start to see noticeable changes in your 911 calls or your violent crimes? The answer is yes, they know it. They might not know about climate change, but they know when it gets hot, people get uh, irritable. Um, and of course, it ruins air quality. So you're talking about serious public health impacts uh, when the temperature gets above, uh, much above 90 degrees. Uh, in a city like San Antonio, where pretty much everyone drives, um, it, it's a really, really serious problem. And so right before we started working with them, the city released a set of three plans uh, called SA Tomorrow. It's a multimodal transportation plan, a comprehensive plan, and a sustainability plan all rolled into one. And so what we're trying to help them do is initiate a series of public dialogues about what different uh, institutions, uh, stakeholders around the city could do to help the city implement these projects. Uh, because there's not really much of a disagreement in the community about what their challenge is going to be over the next 20 years. They're expecting more than a million new residents by 2040. Uh, so transportation and housing affordability are at the top of everyone's mind now because it's already a problem. And if you add a million more people, it's about a 33, 35% increase uh, in the next 20 years. So it's one of the fastest growing regions in the country. Uh, and it also happens to already be one of the largest. And so I think um, sort of the, the big theme that we've been seeing, and to summarize some of these recommendations, how cities can work with their states, with the federal government, uh, to improve resilience of infrastructure, it really gets into the cycle of, of disaster response. And anyone who's worked with FEMA won't be uh, unfamiliar with these uh, four phases of that response. But first, obviously, the federal government has to be a partner in preparing cities uh, for the kinds of challenges they face, whatever those challenges might be. The National Flood Insurance Program definitely needs to be authorized, it needs to be affordable, it needs to be solvent, uh, and that's, that's something that the NLC has had a long-standing position on. Then this, the, the government needs to be able to mitigate some of the disasters uh, that we can't necessarily prepare for 100%. We need to uh, encourage property owners to retrofit existing structures, encourage cities to retrofit existing infrastructure, so that the next generation of infrastructure is actually ready to withstand not the conditions of today, um, but the conditions that are going to be going on in the future. And I know that I've been working uh, on this issue in particular uh, for a number of years. Codes aren't necessarily enough. The code is a minimum for life safety. It's not going to protect property. It's not going to necessarily reduce uh, the kinds of economic uh, uh, disasters that we see after, after a natural hazard. Um, the code will protect you long enough so you can get out of the building unscathed, and then the building's likely totaled. Um, so we need to look at what the, the government can do to encourage property owners, cities, to design infrastructure and buildings to exceed the code so that it reduces that economic loss after the fact. We know, and I'm sure many, many people before me have told you, uh, that $1 in mitigation leads to $4 in post-disaster savings. I don't know if that number is impressed enough, uh, because it is only the federal dollars that are accounted for in that study that uh, the National Institute of Building Sciences did several years ago. That does not uh, count insurance loss. It does not count uh, indirect loss. It's only the, the post-disaster uh, recovery funds. So the actual number when you, all, you know, when you tally up all the indirect costs and, and co-benefits and things of that nature uh, is something closer to one in ten dollars uh, saved. Uh, relief, I, I put this slide together before uh, this, this last week really, um, but continued emergency assistance has to be provided. Um, every time there's a disaster, it seems like there's at least a couple of days of, oh, well, how big is the package going to be? Are they really going to bail out the cities this time? Um, that bargain was struck a long time ago between the federal government and cities, and without probably a decade or two of notice, cities aren't prepared to take on the kinds of emergency uh, relief functions uh, that the federal government can help out with. Uh, and last, recovery. Uh, rebuilding has to consider, and I've already touched upon this, uh, future climate risks, future vulnerabilities, uh, and the fact that infrastructure tends to last longer than its design lifetime. So most infrastructure is built to last maybe 15 years. We know it's really going to be there for 70. 
Uh, with that, you have my contact information. I think we're going to open it up to some questions from the audience for the rest of the time that we have today. Thank you very much. So before we open it up for questions, I just wanted to um, to ask Jeremy Marcus um, if you wanted to talk a little bit about what your boss is doing with regard to Prepare Act, because this it follows directly upon what uh, Cooper was just talking about in terms of thinking about uh, different roles that that uh, people play in in terms of the role of the federal government. And Jeremy's going to talk a little bit about what this means. A little awkward. But, uh, hi, uh, Jeremy Marcus. Um, I'm uh, with Congressman Cartwright. I just wanted to, um, this is great to hear so much about what your people are doing at the local level. And I want to talk a little bit about what we could do, what, um, my boss thinks we should be doing at the federal level um, to help us repair um, both locally and nationally. And so I hope for those of you who might represent a congressional office here, you might be willing, interested in joining us, or if you are, are with an organization, you might be willing to help support this effort. So. Um, as many of you might know, uh, every Congress, the Government Accountability Office comes out with the high risk report. It's looking at where are the biggest fiscal vulnerabilities of the federal government. Starting in 2013 and every Congress since, it's put extreme weather um, right near the top um, of where the federal government faces vulnerability. So um, my boss working with the Government Accountability Office, the administration, and, and dozens and dozens of outside groups put together something called the PREPARE Act. Um, and it does a few really basic common sense things. Uh, the first thing it does, um, and the previous administration had put something very similar into place, is creates an interagency council. So the different agencies with different missions have a place to come together to discuss the issues of preparedness and resilience. There are a few agencies that have this in their core mission. There are agencies like the Department of Defense that think about this every day and do a great job. And there are other agencies that really go about their business and don't think about how extreme weather is going to impact their mission and how they can um, accomplish what they need to. And they need to start doing this, and they need to be able to have the access, the expertise from other agencies for folks who really understand what the future is going to bring in terms of extreme uh, increased prevalence of extreme weather. So that's the first thing, interagency council. The second thing is making sure each agency comes up with a plan. So there already were there already have been mandated, although that's been rescinded recently, but they were mandated to do this every year. Some agencies have been doing a great job, some haven't really been taken as seriously. So putting it into code will make sure that each agency is preparing documents to show how they are going to they're going to accomplish their mission with ex, um, increased prevalence of extreme weather. The third thing it does is make sure that we have the all the data, the best practices available for everyone to use. So if ever not everyone has a five-person resilience staff, but they can still have access to the best information. Um, and the fourth thing is it coordinates federal resources that are regional to make sure that different agencies that have regional presence are talking with each other and talking with local folks. So it's mandating an, an annual meeting, regional meetings, and regional reports to talk about how each region is individually working with the federal government to prepare for extreme weather. So. Um, the bill, it's been scored by CBO. It costs nothing. Um, the National Taxpayers Union had it. Their number two no-brainer last Congress. So this is common sense legislation. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the last few weeks have shown the need for this, and we're hopeful to get it going. Um, our, our, next, our last step, we, we're going to get technical feedback from FEMA. Obviously, they're a little distracted right now, so we're, we're a little delayed. But we're hopefully hope, hoping to introduce this bill in the next month or two. So. Um, Happy to stick around a little bit and answer any questions. And if there's anyone here who wants to get involved or help support the bill, we think uh, it'll help us uh, prepare better next time. So thank you very much. And I'll, I'll just hang out here in case there's a question about that, too, if you don't mind. Okay. Are there any questions for Jeremy before we open it up? Okay. Hi, I'm wondering um, to what extent you considered uh, the role of land trusts in, in helping to change land use and flood from areas. So I would just say... Oh. I would just say the bill, um, what it does in terms of the interagency council is mandate certain areas be represented on the council. Um, certainly land use and natural resource agencies are included in the council, but it does not get down to the detail of mandating what the preparedness should be, how that will be, inter um, how that will be uh, 
specifically directed at land use. Although I will say if you're interested, we also have another bill called the SAFE Act, which is very similar, but directs specifically at the natural resource agencies to do natural resource planning. So um, if you want to talk about that, I'm happy to talk about that separately, but it's very similar, but it's specifically natural resource agencies targeted. Great, thank you. Well, as I mentioned, the city of Flagstaff is nestled in the, the base of the San Francisco peaks and, and surrounded by extremely um, large quantities of forest. Um, we recognize the value within the organization and we do have le legally designated open space that we are working to protect and conserve, um, recognizing that our ponderosa pine trees are not strong carbon sinks, but that the value of our, um, our f a healthy forest is much further than just carbon. And as I mentioned earlier, our water sources are protected because of a healthy forest. So we do recognize that um, in legally designating open space in um, our part of the region is, is a very powerful opportunity um, for us. And we just embarked on it in the last seven years. So yeah. Great. Thank you, uh, Nicole. And I should mention, too, that it's uh, a bipartisan effort and uh, recognizing how important it is for everyone to, um, to find ways to have common sense solutions. I would, I would just add, you know, creating programs all the way down to the neighborhood level of adopt a block or love your resilient block programs that we have, we've now expanded it into our Greenway program and we're creating a Greenway program 2.0 that actually looks at converting the ownership over to local land trusts so that administrations in the future uh, won't be able to develop the land. We also secured uh, last year uh, the largest public park uh, in our city's history, nearly 700 acres, and we negotiated until we were able to get the mining rights uh, and all of the rights so it could never be used for fracking or mining in the future. Uh, this park of uh, nearly 700 acres is the largest urban park in almost 50 years. And then finally, what we're looking at is we're com solving our combined sewer overflow program. We're implementing a green first approach. And in cities like Pittsburgh or Buffalo or Cleveland or Baltimore, we have tons of properties. I have 17,000 empty homes, vacant properties, blighted properties, empty lots. So we call it Plinko. You ever watch Price is Right, Plinko? <laughs> the thing goes down and it goes over here. Which one of those 17,000 do we want to put in a land trust for community groups to redevelop the property into home ownership opportunities? Which ones do we want to gather together in larger areas to be able to work with our Urban Redevelopment Authority in order to redevelop based upon a community plan? And then which ones do we want to leave green to be part of our combined sewer overflow problem that has the best impact of creating a sponge, not a funnel approach to being able to solve the problem. Okay, question back here. Hi, so my name is Raj Lakiani with Athena Power. Um, so really great presentations by everybody. Um, we heard a lot about resiliency and the topic, but I was curious to hear a little bit about migration. You know, so for example, Mr. Martin, you, you have one of your members in West Palm Beach. Um, there's a lot of scientists saying that West Palm Beach is going to be underwater in the next 50 years. How do those discussions happen? You know, what's the economic assessment, I guess, in general versus rebuilding versus just long-term migration? I, I think the, the conversations are just uncomfortable at this point. Um, the, the issue I, I see with a lot of coastal communities is that the, the option isn't there for the community to migrate within itself. So being a representative of cities, it's not like the citizens of West Palm Beach are gonna move eight blocks inland. Um, most, a, a lot of the, the communities along Florida are narrow uh, east to west and, and long north to south. Um, so they're, they're not really having conversations like that at this point. And, and I can tell you that the Southeast Florida Regional Compact, the network of four counties and several hundred jurisdictions is one of the strongest uh, multi-jurisdictional uh, partnerships around sustainability and resilience in the country right now. Um, I don't think that they're, they're at that point. Um, 
so, so on the one hand, there's that at the official level. Um, I, I think Nicole and I were talking earlier about uh, you know, climate refugees, even temporary. Uh, and I, I wonder if that is something that you want to just expand upon now. Absolutely. So in Flagstaff, and as part of our resiliency and preparedness study, we have talked extensively about climate refugees. We're, Flagstaff is about two to two and a half hours north of Phoenix, Arizona. And when temperatures in Phoenix reach well over 100, which they do very frequently, we see an incredible influx of Phoenix residents come up to Flagstaff. So we have to take into consideration not only our visitors, but our climate refugees and our, how our infrastructure can handle that, as well as the depletion of our natural resources as um, a result of that. So it's something that we are talking about. Have we identified strategies um, to deal? It's part of the discussion, but we don't have anything identified specifically yet. Interesting. Okay, over here. Hi. Um, so I'm Bob Colby, and uh, I'm originally from uh, Houston, Texas. And we have a small family-owned mobile home park there. And, uh, and because of Harvey, a whole lot of things have been going on there. And uh, basically, what has happened is we had 45 homes get flooded in about 50 inches of water. And a lot of these homes are now just, you can't live them. And so what we did next, kind of give you the neighborhood level of what goes on in this world, because it's new to us too, is we, we call FEMA, we try to help, but there's 7 million people, so there's a delay. And hurricane already hit. And then um, SBA, we got 3.3 billion funding, so they, they found us over there, which is great. They're talking to us, but we have to fill out a lot of these forms. And these forms are hard to get information quickly because you got to go to your bankers, you got to verify with the department, you got to lose another couple weeks, maybe more. And now, because of the sharp demand spike in mobile homes, because in the South, mobile homes are very prevalent, it's a very common situation, we're waiting another four months to even get a house. That's 45 people who aren't going to get a house, half of them own them. So it's just gone. And so the big issue, which I think probably everyone, if, if you can see it, is everything's retroactive from the information gathering to the funding, to the talking to FEMA, everything is retroactive. And so my question is, what can we do more proactively for small businesses that directly impact low-income families like manufacturing home communities? Good question. Who wants to, I think probably if it, all of you can take a crack at that. Well, no, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is it may not be on the private market side where there's an immediate emergency need, but where the federal government can set up, especially when it comes to housing, opportunities like we have for our military in the Middle East, where you have modular housing that is readily available that could be used for families or individuals and be able to have it in somewhere in this country to be able to be shipped immediately into areas that need housing. And, and that was one thing I, I thought of, but, um, and, and that would be great to put into, but then the question becomes, like, where are they going to put them? So, like, maybe if you made a list of where they go beforehand, but... Yeah, you could do that on a local level, without a doubt. I mean, local governments right now look at land use policy from so many different perspectives in understanding floodplain, whether it's a river or an ocean or a lake you can definitely find areas on higher ground to be able to have access and cities could be able to do that but we wouldn't have the ability to do turnkey private operations just because of the amount of materials that a company would have to have in storage would probably bankrupt it i think uh from a city's perspective certainly one of the challenges is always going to be procurement of any of that that stuff in advance um, procurement of just about anything is a challenge for cities let alone uh you know pre-disaster uh, having materials for disaster recovery on site ready to go um talking about proactively what what can be done uh better um i think at, at the highest possible level, uh, it's, it's really about interagency partnerships and recognizing the fact that all of the infrastructure that cities are investing in, that private uh, industry is also investing in, has to serve multiple functions. We were actually talking about this again this morning where, you know, communities are getting better at rolling up and thinking uh, uh, holistically about these challenges where 
you know, your transportation network is the first point where you're managing your storm water. Uh, thinking about the water energy uh, nexus and how much energy it takes to move water uh, from one place to another in, in a multi-sector way. But then you roll all of that up and you have to start applying for things to the federal government. You start applying for transportation projects where some of those other benefits that you've just tallied at the local level aren't accounted for. Um, they're not recognized and you can't then make that case to the federal agency that's providing uh, some sort of you know matching funding or something along those lines to do the little bit extra that would make your your investment more resilient now I don't think that's going to get to your your recovery planning uh, but it'll certainly mitigate and lessen the impact of what's going on um, uh, so that hopefully FEMA can respond quicker um, that people who are, are more in the eye of the storm are the ones who are being helped first rather than people who are out on the periphery of the storm, something along those lines. Um, but none of that's to uh, downplay the significant. I mean, 50 inches of rain is a ton of rain. There's, there's no city, no amount of pre-disaster planning that was going to you know, significantly mitigate or alter the, the result of, of Harvey. And if I may just add, I think the the overarching issues that we need to systematically remove barriers um, and identifying those is challenging and removing those bar barriers is even more challenging but as we see more and more events extreme events that require assistance they're happening faster and um, we do need to change process David Block, staying with the National Council for Science and the Environment Thank you each for really interesting presentations. Cooper, I'm intrigued by your reciprocal definitions of sustainability and resilience. And I'm wondering, um, with, with each of you, do you see trade-offs between sustainability and resilience? And how do you operationally both optimize sustainability and resilience? <laughs> Your best idea, so. Great. Uh, do I see trade-offs? Um, rarely, uh, I, I think, is the answer there. I, I think it's usually the most sustainable slash most resilient solution sort of presents itself. And then reality of financing, reality of implementation, reality of politics is, is that barrier. It's not um, application of that theoretical definition. I think that's sort of what I would, it's not a trade-off between the two conceptually. I would view under the old urban planning SWOT analysis that strengths and weaknesses tend to be more towards sustainability, opportunities and threats about what could happen is more about resiliency and they sort of form together under the, the SWOT analysis. And I, I think that if you, as you look at it, it's much more holistic. We look, tend to think of uh, both sustainability and resiliency based simply on environment. But it is a whole host of issues. It's every issue. And it's how you plan for it and how you implement. You either do it or you don't. And you're either doing things for the immediacy or you're doing things for the immediacy in the future. Uh, and the biggest challenge to that ends up being coming cost. Because obviously it costs more uh, to put on protections in the roof other than just putting fixing the hole in the roof uh, so that it won't happen again. But um, that's where the politics come in. And uh, that's where the art is made, I guess. Great. Okay. Uh, let's go over here to the corner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, you know, given the funding that's taking place and, and and coastal communities in Florida and Houston, whether you all have worked with the cities dealing with what they can do to shore up their communities against flooding, as in by looking at encouraging wetlands uh, in combination with man-made structures like levees, etc. Uh, what is the what is the advice? What is the common element that you see or you recommend? Um. I guess the first answer to your question is a little. We, we've worked with a few of those cities directly, um, most notably West Palm Beach, which is in our program here. Um, 
I think the recommendations, we, we as an organization almost never make specific recommendations to our member cities about something that they should do um, is the first thing that, that I would say to that. Um, but we do bring in a lot of partners, a lot of other organizations, and we try to facilitate a conversation that will lead to, you know, an outcome that maybe we would have recommended in the, in the beginning. Um, that's neither here nor there. Um, I think the most common thing we, we see right now is the promise of green infrastructure and of integrating stormwater management much more into roadway design because that's what the city owns. You know, the city owns its right of way, it owns its streets, it owns the ground beneath the streets and can do all the utilities that are uh, involved with that. But being able to treat, and, and I think Mayor Perduta said, you know, use it as a sponge, not as a funnel, uh, to, uh, to hold water in place a little bit more to mitigate uh, the kinds of runoff rather than just channeling it uh, directly into sewers, untreated, unslowed, um, causes flash flooding. That's the thing I think is most promising. What about um, strong surges? Oh, well, <laughs> storm surge is a totally different thing. Um, and particularly in Florida, with it, with it being limestone, you can't build a seawall. It goes underneath, like geologically, it will go underneath your seawall. Um, so you have to find a way to uh, create, you know, berms, build on higher ground, um, fill on higher ground, or, you know, again, manage the the uh, the stormwater, the the rainwater when you can. Um, but storm surge, it's it's too specific of a challenge depending on the the hydrology of an area and the geology of an area. Um, Florida's obviously uh, going to have the biggest problem with this, but. From an engineering standpoint, I really don't know the solution. I know it's not a seawall, um, but but I don't I don't know what the uh, the other engineering alternatives are there. If I may just offer a, a non-coastal um, perspective from flooding, because we do have a lot of seasonal flooding uh, in Flagstaff and. We are, we recognize that not only is our flooding um, disruptive to our economic health in our community, but we have a social justice component as well. Um, a lot of our flooding is in our lower socioeconomic um, parts of our community. And we have begun a number of individual projects to try to divert water, create um, Green Street projects. Last year, if I recall correctly, we had 200-year storm events within a week of each other. Um, so we, we have to figure out how to deal with the intensity of our storms. Um, they are getting stronger. Uh, we're seeing a lot more flooding, again, seasonal flooding um, in our community. And so we're trying to incorporate infrastructure improvements, which are significantly expensive, but we really do have to look at it in a holistic way. And again, going back to my comment about approaching this as a systems, um, or as a system, uh, and recognizing that we can really couple a lot of initiatives and infrastructure improvements together, and we should, um, but we can also bring in the cultural piece too, and the, the equity dialogue as well. Let me add one last thing because you guys live in D.C. and there's very little hope in the city. So I want to let you remember that the cities are still out there working on solving problems. And the government actually works and people like, like government. And it's a lot different outside this little area. But um, there's a group called the, it's the Metro Lab Network. And it's over 20 cities that partner with universities and cities all across this country. And we steal each other's ideas on a constant basis. So when Mayor Pete Buttigieg out in South Bend decides that he's going to partner with Notre Dame and they're going to be able to come up with a new way to manage stormwater, it isn't simply through green infrastructure. It's by using technology and sensors within the pipes that's taking it and doing simple things like stopping the flow because a storm doesn't hit a city all at once unless it's a massive storm. It moves. And by using that engineering and tech sen sensor technology, you're able to be able to adapt to the physics of that movement and stop flooding from happening. There's a reason that our poorest communities are always the ones that get hit, because we planned it that way. When we built that big highway and that highway exit made out of concrete, it went right by the poorest houses in the community. And there are no trees there, and there's nothing to be able to handle the water, and it all drops into a system that was built 100 years ago when there were lots of trees and hills and everything else, and it goes to overcapacity. So if we can work with technology, sensor detection, combine cities and universities to work together, we can create things that we're not even thinking about yet to be the solutions to solve it in the future. We certainly hope so.
Okay, we'll go back here. We'll take the two back here, then here, and then over here. Okay. Um, Alice Hughes with Ashray. We represent um, professionals in the building technology industry. Um, I was very curious. Number one, thank you very much for holding this. Um, I was very interested in um, Mr. Moore's comment about building codes are not enough. Um, my question, I guess, is given what you've seen with the rollback in many places of building codes, when you talk about resiliency, do you think about building codes at all as just being at least a building block or a component, if you will, of resiliency, even if you need to do more? Are you even thinking about sort of that essential element or, or what some would call an essential element? I, yeah, I mean, yes, we did, we definitely do, and I'm, I'm increasingly interested in how the National League of Cities can get more involved in the code's uh, uh, creation and adoption process. I don't think that, I, I think where you see rollbacks in the codes, uh, it's unfortunate because it's not necessarily that they don't want to be applying the codes, it's a difficulty of applying and enforcing them. And code enforcement uh, is a much more critical problem in, in local governments around the country than code adoption is. Um, I, I think that's the shortest way I can answer your question. Uh, but yeah, it, it's definitely important. So we, we've also adopted a voluntary program, 2030 Building Districts, in both our downtown and our university area. And this is calling by 2030 a 50% reduction in energy use and a 50% reduction in water use. And we've now, in 2016, we passed an ordinance that's called the Building Benchmark Ordinance, and that requires the owners of all large buildings in Pittsburgh to be transparent in sending in both their water and their electric usage. And looking at that is part of our modeling on potential flooding. But more importantly, it reduces our carbon footprint greatly. And we've been able to do it with the partnership of our corporate community and not against it. And if I may add, there's a really important dialogue here to, to um, bring up, and that's about education and educating, um, as Cooper mentioned, just the enforcement. So you have the education of, of staff, but the building community as well. Um, I also want to add, you know, um, my boss had asked for, in, um, in January, um, GAO came out with a report on the use of forward-looking climate data in building codes and found that most um, code organizations were not looking at um, projections but only historical data and the use of codes. So we actually have a bill called the NIST Success Act, which um, has NIST work with these agencies to use forward-looking climate data to, um, in codes. Um, thank you very much. And, and, I, and it's been very interesting in terms of all of the television coverage, of course, throughout the weekend is in terms of how many times building codes have been mentioned. Um, okay, over here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, you Hi, uh, my name is Tex Hoff, I'm uh, working at the Dutch Embassy. So thank you for organizing this, also for uh, the Netherlands very interesting topic. Um, I was wondering, uh, is there any focus, maybe especially for Pittsburgh, as it is a, an industrial background, on a certain economy, when you try to combine the uh, industry background with resilience of the future? Is it focused in your policy somewhere? Or? You didn't read my tweet. <laughs> yes, it's our economic future. Um, no, uh, so yeah, um, without a doubt, uh, Allegheny County is now the largest employer in the state of Pennsylvania in clean energy jobs. The clean energy industry in Pennsylvania has more employees than the coal and uh, natural gas industry combined. Um, we view it as not only part of our future in the sense of being able to build out a, a new economy and be able to attract companies like Google and Uber and Microsoft and Intel and Tata and Bosch and everybody else, but a critical part of seeing that expansion of our economy as well. So we view it really holistically. We look at transportation and say, what's transportation gonna be in the future? It's gonna be shared, autonomous, and electric. What are we doing now 
to be able to do it. So we're creating corridors within our city. We're powering them with electric. We're creating microsystems of microgrids over eight different projects simultaneously happening right now and anything from natural gas to 100% renewable. And we're doing all of our major new developments under microgrid systems to become much more efficient and to lower carbon footprint, especially in low income neighborhoods. And then we're working on job retraining in order to be able to get people locally involved in those jobs. It all fits together from the buildings that we're doing in the 2030 districts to our own incentives to be able to get to 100% renewable by 2035, to be able to create new energy systems today and new transportation options based upon technology for tomorrow, you put it all together. And then you know what? You'll get to compete in 30 years with other cities that are doing it. And those that aren't doing it now are going to have to play catch up. You heard it here. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to add a, from a very small town perspective, but we're, we're working really hard with our economic vitality department and our goal is to create uh, and to educate, but create more programming and policies. Then when we are talking about economic development, we do look at impacts on our natural resources uh, in our community and what types of businesses are being attracted. Are they water intensive? Um, I mentioned earlier today in a meeting that our last well that we um, the city installed was 2,700 feet deep. So water for us is a very um, energy intensive uh, resource. And so we, we really need to look at this, going back to the holistic comic that Mayor Peduto just mentioned, we have to look at this collectively. And so when we talk about economic development, we also want to look at the impacts on our natural resources. Great, thank you. Okay, here and then we'll back there and here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my name is David Havis. I'm with the Institute for Building Technology and Safety, IDPS. I actually have two questions, but Cooper, you answered one of them already when you talked about infrastructure system resilience. My other question is, what has been your experience in the role of public-private partnerships in helping pay for resilience? I'll stop taking practice. It depends on where the partnership is based. So in seeing public partners, public private partnerships that are based through either banks or utilities, for the most part, they're basically created in order to be able to make money for them. Uh, we had a very similar plan to Chicago's with parking authority and had a chief economist, former chief economist of the SEC advise us that the best you could do is lose $2 billion in this deal. So we want to be able to figure out a way that allows public assets to remain the public while at the same time trying to find better ways than just raising rates in order to be able to recover um, revenue. What does that mean? It means when looking at a water authority, do you have the ability to sell excess water? Do you have the ability to do it if you're a municipal authority or do you have the ability to do it if you're created into a public corporation? Um, looking at that is a potential revenue source that can come back to the ratepayers. But simply the private partner, public partnerships that benefit um, bondholders or stockholders isn't something that we're very interested in pursuing. We are looking at other options of being able to keep the asset public while being able to capture revenue that we couldn't otherwise. For our community, public-private partnerships are going to be critical um, in how we move forward. And as I mentioned, the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project is really a fantastic example and a first step that our community has made in a multi-agency relationship. Uh, and the results have been quite successful. We are looking at a number of projects. Um, hopefully, I'll have the opportunity to update folks at a later date on. But I look at that as a critical component of, of our success, at least in our community. We'll go on. I think that's, that captures the dichotomy of experience well. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Jerry Hill. I'm with the Patsy Town Institute. And may you mention microgrids. Uh, we know how to make buildings energy efficient, right? We can retrofit them. But up in Pittsburgh, you're also looking at direct current microgrids. We are. Would you speak a bit about whether you're thinking about that at the city block level? Yeah, so 
in India, in Europe, DC, power grids are pretty common. There's over 5,000 that operate within um, both continents, uh, providing local energy much, much more efficiently uh, and directly to source. Um, in the United States, there's five. Uh, and we have two uh, in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, one is actually in our lowest income neighborhood in, in the city and it is raising tilapia and is an urban garden indoor that's 100% powered with renewable sources. And the other is a shipping center of 18-wheeler tractor trucks. And both are developed by local uh, companies in western Pennsylvania. Uh, if you ask me the future of energy, and I'm not an expert, but what I believe is it's not going to be based on 18th century. It's not going to be 100 and some miles away burning sources out of the earth dripping electricity all along the way and being 38% efficient at the end, basically losing the majority of the energy in the production and transportation of the energy till it gets to your coffee pot in the morning. Future of energy will be based right in your own neighborhood and it will be based upon your property which will become very much more efficient as well. We won't be using as much energy. So when I sit down and I talk to the folks from People's Natural Gas or Console Energy or the areas of Western Pennsylvania that helped to build the energy economy of, of the United States, the giants that are still there. At first they were, well, we don't really see it that way. Now they're partnering with us. People's Natural Gas is one of our partners in being able to create a microgrid within the city of Pittsburgh. They're bidding on taking over our old steam plant, which is falling in on itself, to do cogeneration and create both heat and electric for our downtown. And they see this as an opportunity to expand their portfolio, to be able to partner early on with a city and then offer that same service to other cities around the country. And those forward-thinking fossil fuel companies will be able to see another 100 years because they'll have invested now. Great story. I'm glad that came up. Okay, over here. Hi. I'm Joe Sanchez. I represent... Capital Solutions here in the uh, D.C. metropolitan area. Um, Cooper, you had mentioned the importance of managing stormwater runoff, and it's becoming increasingly important. Uh, Nicole, you had talked about uh, asphalt engineering, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, my company deals with stormwater runoff. We actually produce a product that is flexible and porous, and it's a surface product, and so you sort of have to, I mean, all these solutions that I hear you talking about, you know, I see the need for us to think outside the box a little bit. It's not just the water runoff already in the streets, it's all those areas that contributes to that, like sidewalks. We replace a lot of sidewalks with our product in the D.C. area. We're talking about rooftops. Our product is great for rooftops because it's lightweight. You know, ours is just one technology. But, you know, as we develop these systematic approaches, we have to, you know, factor in not just the big technologies, you know, that, that you know, channels and whatnot. We need, to talk, we need to think about materials that we're using in those solutions. And I think, I think that's going to be the way of the future. And the more, the more we can do that, the better. But we also talked about historic areas. Um, you have to balance historic preservation against safety. And so, you know, I see all these areas in D.C. In Georgetown, I don't think these are the same sidewalks that they had, you know, 200 years ago. I think, you know, I think there's been some modernization of the brickwork and, and things like that. But, you know, when you, if you can think outside the box and incorporate a solution like ours into a design, you know, we can, we can salvage that historic feel of some of these communities. Um, but that's, that's really my point, is that we, we need to look at materials and not, you know, not just structure. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would just add to that, um, you're right, and I've probably been using green infrastructure as shorthand for all of that, that stuff, um, not just roads, but sidewalks, alleys, um, rooftops. Um, but I, I think the more cities that can come out with design guidelines for that kind of infrastructure, for street design, you know, Philly has some good ones for planters and bulb outs and things like that where they're, they're incorporating a lot of different things. Here's how you can treat, you know, a street of this width. Here's how you can treat a neighborhood street. Here's how you can treat an alley, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, there's, there's only a handful of those nationwide right now, and I can tell you that very few cities are going to just look at what Philly has done and say, great, we'll take it. Um, everybody wants to do their own design guideline, their own, their own treatment of it. Um, so you're right, but we need more proliferation of those examples so that a city can look at a peer and not Philadelphia or not you know, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, or Syracuse, or a couple of the other cities that are doing this pretty well. I would add it goes back into the economic development argument. Uh, when we designed a new uh, environmental center, we decided to meet the highest standards, the living building challenge. Uh, that a building would use the same energy as a flower, uh, meaning that everything is, there's no plug-ins or pipes or anything. The building is producing all of its energy, producing all its water, producing all its heat and everything from the building itself. It's our second in the city. We actually created one of the first at uh, Phipps. So the beautiful thing about Phipps is all of the products, the carpet, the lighting, everything had to meet the highest standard and all either owned by local uh, Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, Northern West Virginia companies or manufactured there. So we were not only able to create this amazing building, but we were also able to build it with local companies. And as those standards start to get higher than lead platinum, and they will, those types of products are gonna be sought after to be in the buildings that we're building globally. And the question we have to ask ourselves are, are we gonna buy that carpet from China? Or are we gonna buy it from Eastern Ohio? Are we gonna be able to buy the furniture that has been made out of recycled materials from India? Or are we gonna buy it from Western Michigan? And we have the opportunity right now to be able to be a part of that. Thank you, thank you. And I want to thank all of you for your really thoughtful, good questions. And I want to say thank you to our panel for a wonderfully thoughtful, informative discussion. And I think we should have you all come back and keep this whole discussion going. So please join me in thanking you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>